Hello there fams, it's Al here on Al's Geek Lab, back for 2022. Happy New Year. If you haven't seen my little wrap up of the year 2021, then, then just head on over to that because I did that stream live as well. Um, I'm recording this live completely unscripted um, and I thought, whatever, why not? So uh, what I'm gonna do today is I'm going to enable a share of my Raspberry Pi. So I've got some files on my Raspberry Pi I wanna to share to my DOS computer. And there's a multitude of ways you can do this, actually turns out. Uh, most of those ways are convoluted to some extreme or another. The best way is probably using um, FTP. So you fire up something like FileZilla and then you connect to your uh, PC. So your old PC, your retro PC will be running something like Michael Brutman's FTP service. Okay, so you'll be running the Michael Brutman FTP server on your old PC and then you can connect into it from your Windows PC or your Linux PC or your Mac or whatever, right? So you can transfer your files like that. But that means that you have to then Go onto your old computer, start up the file transfer daemon or server or whatever, and then go onto your, like, basically run from that computer back over to your other computer and then fire up FileZilla and then copy the files across from that point to that point. And that is just a pain in the ass. So for today, what I thought I'd do on this video is show another technology. Um, although Michael Brutman's method is great, it does, it does work very reliably. It is pretty straightforward. It's a bit... Um, long-winded this way is kind of a bit more i guess what you'd be used to normally and when i say what you'd be used to normally when you're in a windows pc you go into the you know the f drive or the g drive when you're looking for a network drive right you go into windows explorer or something like that when you're on a dos pc well you could go into the f drive or the g drive if you had dos networking set up back in the day um which we could do, and there's plenty of videos out there showing you how to use MS-DOS uh, client for networking. But that is a pain in the ass too, and there's a whole bunch of things that go along with that. And then there's, there's NFS as well, which is another way to work, and I've not had much success with that. So needless to say, I've tried a few ways to actually get a straightforward, reliable, quick and easy way just to get files across from one place to the other. So this way, is using my Raspberry Pi, which has a reasonable amount of storage on it, and I can connect other USB hard drives to it, or thumb drives as well, I suppose, and I could share data through that all day long. And on top of that, I can enable Samba on the Raspberry Pi so that I can connect through Windows, I guess, to share the files from the Raspberry Pi. Okay, with me, I guess? All will become clear but basically the main thing is I want to go on my retro PC and just type in X colon do a DIR and see all of the files that are on my Raspberry Pi and I can do with them whatever I want okay so that is the mission today for that we're going to use a tool called ether DFS and the server component runs in uh, the Linux side, runs on the Raspberry Pi, can run on any Linux machine, I think. It's relatively new, it's 2018, I think, the last timestamp on it is. Um, so you can uh, you can download that, it's free, it's open source. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not being maintained right this minute, but it's pretty stable. I had no problems um, building it and installing it and making it all happen. And so, without further ado, let's get right to it. So I'll just bring up my desktop here and I'm already connected up to my Raspberry Pi. Um, what I'll do as well is bring a window up here which has the um, Ether DFS website. Just to show you what it looks like. So I'll go over to this download area and on there you can see the two things that you need to download. You need to download EtherDFS, which is the client part, which runs on your PC. 
And I guess, you know, if you wanted to have that start up with your PC every single time on your old retro machine, you'd stick that in the um, auto exec bat, or you could make a little batch file for that. More on that later. And then the Ether SRV Linux as well. So yeah, you can download the latest version here, this, this one here, 2018. And also you want to download the Ether DFS and um, stick that um, V0.82 version onto your machine. Now, so obviously that's on your, when I say your machine, your retro machine. Um, you want this one, the Ether DFS, not the Ether SRC, that's the source code. If you have a way to get that onto your retro PC, then uh, easily, then I would do it that way. So if you've got some other networking things set up already, then just put that zip file on there already. If not, um, then refer to my 2020 video on how to get networking and DOS set up. And um, there's a whole video on <laughs> networking and DOS on my channel. I'll link to it above and below. All right, cool. All right, so now I'm on my Raspberry Pi here. So this is actually how I downloaded it. I went and used eLinks. So I have eLinks, which I installed. So I did a sudo apt install eLinks like this. And it's saying it's already installed, so that's cool. But you probably won't have it installed. eLinks is just a text mode web browser. It just means you can browse um, web pages in text mode on the Raspberry Pi. So if you don't have a monitor hooked up to your Raspberry Pi, you can still visit web pages, albeit in text mode, which is really weird if you've never browse the web in text mode before, but it is a way to do it. And it just saves you, um, you know, getting a USB stick and popping it in the the Raspberry Pi, right? You can actually just download the Ether DFS stuff directly on the Raspberry Pi. So that's exactly what I did here. Um, so I did that and here's the, um, here's the link. Now you can see it looks totally rotten. And it says, it says it says as much as says, oh no, some styles failed to load. Yeah, just don't worry about that. If you keep going down the page through all this random rubbish, um, it says download latest version of Ether DFS, which is obviously the DOS stuff, which you actually don't need. But down here, so you just have to um, hunt, seek and ye shall find. If you see, look at that there, which is now highlighted, you can see the Ether SRV Linux file there if I just do down there and I think if I hit return one more time it will then tell me yeah it tells me that I can save it so I'll just save that save to file boom okay and now it's downloaded I press escape file exit yep and now you can see that the uh, etherserve Linux file has been downloaded successfully. So what we need to do now is just uncompress it. So we use XZ first. Dot tar. I think it's X. XZ. Oh yeah, it's um, XZ. Uh, dash D, that's it. I don't use XZ very much. I usually just use um, GZ. So XZ dash D, and then we want to do tar XVF ether serve Linux dot tar. Okay, and then it will now decompress that into a folder which is called ether serve Linux. 2018.02.03. If we go into there, you can see a bunch of things. Um, you won't see this one straight away. You'll see pretty much everything else. Uh, you'll see this make file and um, there's a text file as well, which has got the instructions in. So if we just have a look at the instructions quickly, it just basically tells you to run a, um, these are the usage instructions, but it also tells you to, how to, to build it. So basically to make it, to build it, you just type in make. Um, it, it's telling me at the moment that it's up to date. If you have any problems with that, then you probably need to install build essential like that, okay? 
So um, that, that is um, all of the tools that you require to compile source code. So if, you, if you're having any problems when you, do, you need to type in make uh, there, then that's probably um, because you don't have the build essentials. So make sure that you do sudo apt install build essential to, to do that. And there you go. Um, that's how to do that. So once all of that is done, you should have a new file here, which is this binary here, the etherserve Linux file. And I can uh, run that by doing that. Now this needs to be, you need to be root in order to actually run it. So um, do remember that you need to do sudo or something like that in front of it. Um, what I will show you as well is how to get it to run on startup every time with your machine because you probably just want to share this every time your Raspberry Pi starts up. Okay, so um, let's just for let's let's for um, let's for demonstration's sake for the moment just test that it works first of all. So what we need to do first is if we have a look in the um, text file, we can t uh, we can see the. Uh, usage instructions. So you start it up by specifying the interface you want it to listen on to, and then the directory where you want to mount um, the share. Okay. Uh, in fact, it tells you right there. So it's basically a virtual C drive. Okay. Obviously, Linux itself doesn't work with C drives or D drives or whatever. It uses mounts, but basically, it's going to call it a, a C drive so that MS DOS understands what it is you're doing. Um, what it does is it also recommends that you don't just use a normal um, uh, file system like a Linux file system or, or whatever um, because uh, Linux file systems or what, even modern Windows file systems like NTFS have all sorts of manners of strange things like they have NTFS uh, parameters on it, they have permissions in it, they have uh, Unicode, like UTF-8, all that sort of stuff. And I think it says something along those, on those lines here. So what it recommends is it make it recommends that you use the FAT file system, file allocation table, which is what MS-DOS natively uses. And the good thing about that is you can actually, it's, it's natively supported within Linux as well. So all you have to do is create a um, file system file. Um, and that is the option that I've gone to do. So it tells you, it gives you an example of doing just that there. So if you do F allocate, um, what I'll do is I'll actually just um, bring up another window. Um, I know what I'll do. My Tmux to, to the rescue. Let's split screen this. Split screen this goodness. And um, I'll just have a look down there. You can see f allocate bat.img. And if I go over to this terminal, I actually already have this fat.img. I already created it. So I'm just going to create another one, um, but this one, f allocate dash l 1024m by the way is one gig. So you could make this a, a larger file um, and then call it whatever you want. Okay, so you could call it dos.img or fat.img is the example there. And just like that, super quick, lickety split, you can see there's now a file in there called dos.img. And if I um, think, Exist. Yeah, if you look at the content of that file, um, you can see there is literally just a nothing file. There is, this is the binary data inside that file. There is nothing in it. It's just an empty file, a container, literally nothing in it, okay? Um, so um, that that's obviously not used to, useful to anyone. What you need to do now is make a file system on that file. So you do MKFS, make a file system, MS-DOS in this particular case, because we want the DOS fat file system, and we'll do it on this DOS.img file. And it's done it. And now if we take a look at the binary again off the top of that file, you can see that this has um, now got the, um, the FAT32 
file allocation table in it, so it's actually got some real data in it. Um, this is, by the way, this is just an adjunct just to, to show you what the, these things look like. Um, and now what you can do is you can mount that file system. Now you do need to be root for that one, so you need to do sudo mount-o loop, and then in this case it's dos.img slash mnt, and then wherever you want to mount it. So when I say wherever I want to mount it, um, I've already got one called DOS here, which I've already done before with that IMD. So if I do mount, um, you can see there fat.img. So I'll do this as an example for you. So now what I need to do is create that mount point. So to do that, I'm going to create it inside slash MNT. You can create it pretty much anywhere, to be honest with you. But you need to make sure that the mount point is mounted as root. Okay. So the first thing I need to do is uh, create a directory for the mount point. So in this case, I will call it DOS, sudo mkdar DOS. Okay. And that has now created a directory called DOS. Now I can um, change the ownership of it, but really that that shouldn't really make any difference because it is a DOS one. But there you go. Um, Okay, so now I'm ready to mount that file that I made, that the uh, DOS image file, into that directory. Does that make sense? I hope. I hope that makes sense. So basically, we created that uh, DOS um, image file, and we're actually going to make it a usable file system. It might make sense. If it doesn't, put it put it in the comments, and I'll try and explain it a bit better. But basically, we want to do sudo. Again, this has to be done as root, and we do mount, just kind of like the example here, right? So we do mount dash O loop. So dash O means options. So I'm saying I'm specifying an option of loop, which means to loop back. So rather than mount a real physical file system on a disk somewhere, I'm looping back this file uh, that I have here. So it's just a, an image file. And the image file that we have is the one in um, etherdfs. I should actually do this from the, the home directory. But I'll, I'll do that, okay? Um, so back in the, the etherdfs file directory that we were just in, I'll, I'll mount this one here. So the mount, sudo mount, dash o loop. And then we'll do dos.img file that we just created and then we'll do slash mnt slash dos okay if you get that then that's it's worked okay and if we now go into cd mnt dos again we shouldn't be able to do anything in this unless we're root so if i try and touch file it gives me a permission denied so if i do sudo touch file it works okay so now I have a file in there called file. Ah, oh, right, okay. Now so I've um, created a file called readme.dos, which is a normal text file in Linux, all right? Um, but if you look at the way um, a, a new line is written in DOS versus Linux, you'll see that the file system works slightly differently. So not the file system, but the, the control um, uh, sequence for new lines is different. So um, have a look at that file. We'll have a look at that when we have a look in DOS on the old machine. And you can see in when you're using Unix to write text files, they use a new line, they don't use the MS-DOS convention, which is carriage return new line. So that's when, when you see all this, that basically means that it's not wrapping the new lines like it would in a normal DOS system. That's fine. Don't need to worry about that unless you're doing stuff um, with text file editing across platforms. So the last thing I need to do now is to actually start up the Etherserve process so that it can share that um, mount point. So I don't need to create that mount point ever again. That's done. Um, I, I just need to mount it uh, uh, for use in the future if I unmount it. Um, but 
So I need to sh share this mount point out and I use etherserve-linux for that. So again, this needs to be run as root. So sudo etherserve-linux and here are the options. I have um, two options really, um, the two of the main options. I mean, I can choose these options, but um, we don't need to worry about that. The main options, I need to specify the interface that it's going to listen on and also the root path. Um, which in this case will be our C drive, so um, or the DOS image. So um, if we have a look here, um, uh, I can do ifconfig or some in, in different Linux distributions, I IP dash space A will show us the interfaces that we have on our machine, um, and we can sh we can see that the um, the interfaces that I have on this one are. LO, which is the local loopback interface, which it's not a proper interface, so we don't worry about that one. Uh, we also uh, don't worry about the ETH0, which is the, the the wired Ethernet. That one is uh, that is unplugged; it's not plugged in to anything. So uh, the one that is running with an IP address is this one here, WLAN0. So that's the one I'm going to choose for exporting my share. So I want to do etherserve linux and I want to do wlan0 and I want to do mnt slash dos, which is where I did it. And I also need to run this as root. So I do sudo in front of it. Just do it like that. And that's it. Um, so yeah, piece of cake, really. <laughs> um, so you can see drive C is mapped to mnt slash dos and it's listening on the WLAN interface, which has this MAC address, by the way. So you can also see that if you go um, ifconfig, you can see the MAC address in here as well. So the, those numbers will, will match. You shouldn't need to worry about the MAC address because the DOS client should be able to automatically detect which uh, MAC address you're supplying the share on. But if you do need to know the MAC address, it is given to you here when you start up the daemon. Okay, so we'll go over to the PC now and we'll check that this is working properly over on the PC. So now all I need to do is run etherdfs on the machine itself. So I'm going to do that by doing this here. So um, before I do that, I'll just do etherdfs just to show you what the options are. So I have my packet driver, like most people, installed at interrupt zero times sixty. Um, it will auto detect that. Um, so I don't. I'm not going to bother setting slash p. Um, I'm not going to bother with this or the quiet mode or unloading or anything like that. So my, my option here really is to auto discover the, um, the Linux, the Raspberry Pi machine, and then use the um, X drive on the local machine. So basically, obviously I'm already using C drive, C colon is in use, it's the main hard drive, um, but I want to mount the C colon off the Raspberry Pi. Um, so I'm just saying C dash X, um, which will mount the C drive as X colon. And I'm auto searching for the Raspberry Pi by denoting these two colons there. I could specify the MAC address from the Raspberry Pi, but I shouldn't need to do that. Let's have a look. Okay, it's found it. So it's found um, the MAC address. It's it found the packet driver as well at 60 and it's mounted X colon as the C colon from this particular MAC address, which is the MAC address of the Raspberry Pi. But anyway, now if I go on to X, I now have an X drive. I didn't have that before. And as you saw in my Raspberry Pi when I was in there, I had two files in that image file, readme.dos and hello.txt. So if I type in hello.txt, there we have the contents of the file, edit hello.me.txt. Yeah, this is another test, this time from MS. Yes. 
Okay, so that's a new file. So in, a, in DOS here, there are three files and I'll just turn it back into the Raspberry Pi and I should see all of those files as well on both sides. So on the Unix side or the Linux side, I guess. Yeah. And there you go. So now we have cross uh, file transfer, easily doable through MS-DOS as well as on Linux. Now that we're back and we're happy that everything's working on the PC, let's do the last part, which is tying it all together and making it all come up on boot. So um, on a Raspberry Pi, the it's Debian based. So um, there is a file called RC local. Um, it's not a great way to to do it, but it is a it is a file that you can use. Um, depends depending on your distribution of Linux, you will need to change this to suit your distribution of Linux probably. I say probably if it's Debian, you'll be all right. But RC local um, is just like a kind of arbitrary startup script that allows you to start up um, options. And you can see in here, like I've got a few things in here already, which allow me to, to do stuff. I've actually got a um, tool called rclone, which allows me to map my um, Google Drive on, on Linux. So, um, uh, and I've also used um, PC NFSD as well, which doesn't work very well for me. Okay, so obviously what I wanna do is make sure that I'm exporting that um, share. So I need to do a couple of things. First, I need to actually mount the share. There's two ways I can do that. I can actually just type in um, mount in here and do it the way that we did before. Um, usually I would use the etc. FS tab file for mounting uh, file systems, but because this is really a kind of virtual file system, it's not it's not a real one. It's just a it's just a virtual disk. In effect, I'm just going to use the same method that I did. I typed in sudo mount dash all loop fat image blah 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 to do this. So I'm actually just going to do that here in this file. Not the most elegant way to do it, but we'll definitely get the job done. Not a problem. Um, but if you wanted to do it properly, then you would use the fs tab file. And then obviously now I need to start up the. Um, I don't need to specify sudo because these are done by root. These are all executed through root. Um, now I just want to. Um, run my ether serve and I just can't remember where it's at. What's the directory called? What I need to do now is just say home AJ Ross ether DFS slash Yeah. Okay, so it's basically that it has to be the full path to wherever you installed it. So if you installed it in somewhere nicer, that might be a, um, a better option um, than that horribly long path there, but that's where I've put it. I've put it in my home directory in another folder called ether DFS, then ether SRV Linux, um, which is the directory it expands to. And then the actual binary itself, ether SRV Linux, and then wlan0, then mnt-dos. So those two commands will be executed um, on startup. So with any luck, when you reboot your machine, those, those two will come up um, without having to worry about any more typing at all. That's it. So you would only have to do that once and then you can kind of forget it all. And just in case, you fancied uh, using Samba, I'll just show you quickly how to do that. So basically Samba will allow you to share the files which are on the Raspberry Pi with the rest of your Windows slash Mac slash Linux network. Okay, so you can share them out across a more modern network as well. All right, so the way you do that is you do sudo app install Samba. Okay, so what you want to do is create a um, file called smb 
dot c o n f i think and inside there you want to stick something along the lines of this i'll just paste that in there um so i'll just give you a quick walk through of what this is so basically the share that the windows machines are going to see so when you go into the windows file explorer or whatever you're going to see a net the network and in the network you're going to see a computer called pydos and and the share oh, sorry the share is going to be called PyDOS, not the computer. The computer is going to be called Raspberry Pi or whatever. But the um, share inside there is going to be called PyDOS. Um, and that will point to the local directory on the Raspberry Pi called slash MNT slash DOS, which is, if you remember, the directory where we've got all our uh, DOS goodies for our um, retro machine. I've made it writable, basically saying you can write to this and read from it. So if obviously said no there, then that means it would be read only. You couldn't put anything on it. Um, create mask and directory mask of 0777, which basically means read, write and execute uh, in terms of the Unix permissions on that. And then also public equals yes. So um, in terms of security, that's a bad thing, TM, because those uh, that combination of permissions opens it wide up to the network. Uh, anybody on the local area network, local being important, it's not the internet or anything like that, but the local network. So anybody on the network could put, put any files they want on that and read any files back off. So if that was a big deal to you, obviously you might want to say, no, it's not public and create users. But I don't really care about anything like that. Nothing on it's going to be private. So I'm just going to um, put files um, on there and yeah, everything will be super. Um, so yeah, not, not a big deal. So um, let's just um, if, see if I can restart the Samba service. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So yeah, just to um, just to give you uh, an overview of what's happened there, just so everything is 100% clear, um, I created a file which you can edit uh, in the etc. Samba folder. There was no Samba folder, so I did mkdir uh, Samba first of all, and then inside there I created uh, the SMB file, which was as as um, follows, so smb.con file. And then I did um, service or system CTL, um, which is the appropriate way to do it, um, uh, start and then smbd. So we'll just do stop, smbd, stop the service, and then we'll start it. And then once it's started, you shouldn't get any error messages, but the other way to confirm that Samba is definitely running at this point is to run PS and just check that it's running there, something like that. Um, is, you'll also need um, the naming daemon as well. And... Yep, so the same applies there. And um, if I do NMB now, it's it's there. And then you just need to make sure that both are enabled. So basically by enabling those services, that means that the next time your computer starts up, those services will start up with the computer by default. So enable NMB, NMDB. And then again, the same, bar, same for SMBD. Okay, so now both of them should start up the next time the machine reboots. So you don't have to worry about doing that automatically. And now if I go into my file explorer on my Windows machine, I should be able to just go on to my network. Now, one way I can do it is to go to the name of the machine, which is Raspberry Pi. Or I can just browse to the um, IP address as well. So it's probably the quickest and easiest way to do it than wait for it to discover like this. Because sometimes Samba, I don't know what it is, but it's a bit janky when it comes to um, like names like that. 
it doesn't really work and sometimes they just don't auto discover. So um, we know from ifconfig that the IP address was this one here. So we can actually just do that. If you run into any authentication issues, if you need to have a user account set up for whatever reason, you can do that. You use the SMB passwd file uh, program. So you just do that, uh, set a password. Well, that works, yeah, cool. So that adds the user, the dash A uh, adds the user and I've just used my username there. Okay, cool. Let's have a look now. Get my IP address and just test this out. You can tell I'm doing this live, right? <laughs> Super secure password. Yay! There we are finally. <laughs> PyDOS is there, and there are the files that I set up what feels like hours ago now um, and yeah so there they are I'm reading them on my Windows machine as well so if you want to um, if you want to mount that path um, onto your machine every single time you can also do that um, so then you go into this PC you map a network drive and you go there and you can choose whatever drive letter you want and then all you have to do is do backslash backslash then the IP address and then uh, the PyDOS was the name of the share. Um, you can do it this way though as well. And um, reconnect it, sign in. That will mean that it will always connect. Um, connect using different credentials. You can do that if um, you've set up different credentials to the one that you use for your Windows me machine, uh, in which case I have not, so that's fine. So yeah, so now every time I'm in my PC, I can see Z colon, um, there as the the pie so I, I i always got access to um that that share so that is basically in a nutshell how you access your um your retro machine um across your entire network you can you can mount it on a mac you can mount it on linux you can mount it on your uh, retro machine and um that's that's all there is to it i hope that this has been helpful if you've got any questions uh, you know what to do hit me up in the comments below if you like this video um, I would really really appreciate a thumbs up uh, reason why um, I don't know if you know this but YouTube's algorithm tells well it tells YouTube that the content is somewhat good in some way and that that then means that other people get to see the content um, other people that it thinks might like the content and that's a good thing because the channel grows and it encourages me to make more content for you guys so it's a kind of a vicious love cycle of good things and then of course press the subscribe button and press the bell next to that and select all notifications so then you get notified about all of the uh, up and coming videos um, because I'd love for you to see all of them uh, and uh, again, get your feedback on all of those videos. Really do appreciate your time. And um, yeah, thanks very much for watching. I will be with you very soon here on Al's Geek Lab. Got some great content coming up for you here in 2022. But for now, thanks very much for watching. See you later.